Okay, um, so I, as you can see from this very informative slide, <laughs> write something called YA. Uh, how many of you sort of know what that means? Um, yeah, pretty much everybody. Uh, Ten years ago, probably nobody would have known what that meant, which is interesting itself. Um, and and bec you know, quite often I do talk about teenagers and technology to people who know a lot less than you guys, so I could be like the expert in the room, but clearly I am not right now. What I am the expert in the room in is, is YA. So what I'm going to do mostly is, is historici historicize this term, which is a way of historicizing what teenagers are, which is, I think, totally key in understanding what we're, we're going from. And, and everything interesting I'm going to say is going to come out of this history. Um, so why is a slightly odd term? People often question how, you know, why don't we just say teen books, books for teenagers? And that's actually because the, the term YA dates from before the term teenager. Um, you know, to some extent, it, it, it comes before, it starts to come out of places before the concept of teenagers was invented. Um, cast your mind back to 1906. I'm going to put a lot of dates up in effort to like, make this actually historical. Um, this is Anne Carol Moore, and her job title at the New York Public Library was Director of Work with Children. And so basically, she was in charge of putting together children's programs, which sort of went up to age 10 to 12-ish. And she was sort of the first person there to say, you know how we have these children, and then we, we, like, we like throw them out of the children's section? and they go away and they become ruffians in the street and they do these other things and they're not really adults yet, but they're not, you know, but at the same time, they're not children anymore. Like, maybe we should do a thing about this thing that we don't have a word for. And, and that was actually quite revolutionary. Um, a couple hundred years ago, you know, there was basically no such thing as teenagers. There were children and adults. Um, this is obviously a rough <laughs> process of what's going on, but people 13, you know, turned 13, they joined the Navy, they got married, they went to mines and factories, they did other things like that quite often. Uh, many young people worked 60-hour work weeks, child soldiers were common, um, you know, in the Civil War, an 11-year-old won the Medal of Honor. Um, there was a, uh, there was one of the ships at Trafalgar was wound up being commanded by a 13-year-old because all of the other officers on board had been killed, and he was the last sort of gentleman standing. Um, so, of course, teenagers are a thing that had to be invented eventually. Now, they're largely a Western invention, and one way to look at their nascent state is to, to look at, the, um, at Victorian Britain in the throes of Industrial Revolution. I'm just going to give you like three totally random data points in 1833, the workday for 11 to 18-year-olds was shortened, shortened to a mere 12 hours. Um, in 1844, the age for joining the Royal Navy was increased to 14. <laughs> so your, your, you know, your 11-year-old powder monkeys were no longer deployed on ships. You had to be like uh, of the ripe old age of 14 to go on a sailing ship. And in 1926, much later, the minimum age of marriage was increased to 16. So this is, of course, just three little dots in a whole set of things that are going on, having to do with labor laws and other kinds of permissions and, and, other, and other things about the way kids are exploited and how kids can work and all that stuff. Um, and what, what's, what at least some parts of our world were doing at that time was opening up this space, opening up a space of slow transition between children and adulthood in a way that used to be a, a, a relatively fast transition. You know, you did your bach mitzvah, you jumped off a thing with vines strapped to your ankles, you did whatever you did to like signify that you went from being a child to an adult, and it was relatively instantaneous. And so what we're developing here is, is a way of, of lengthening out that process, and we're sort of opening up a space between these two different statuses. Um, we weren't really there yet in 1906. And what was interesting about Caroline Moore's project was that there weren't really books written for teenagers. There were kids' books. Um, there were, you know, and, and, and they went up to sort of age 12-ish. And those books were generally illustrated. And, I mean, adults' books were illustrated in 1906 as well, so that wasn't, wasn't as big a deal. But what she did to create these sort of older children's 
collections was she went through adult books and found stuff that would be of interest to teens. Um, in 1929, they, uh, the NYPL published its first list, which was called Books for Young People. So YA was originally a category that was a curated set, subset of adult books. And even now, of course, the category contains many books that were originally written for adults that had been sort of reverse grandfathered in to YA, like Catcher in the Rye and To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, so in 1941, something opened up called the Nathan Strauss Branch. It was in the West 40s, and it was intended for patrons 13 to 21. The head of that branch, this is Margaret Scoggin, wrote a weekly column for a library journal called Books for Older Boys and Girls. And in 1944, she changed the name to Books for Young Adults. So already it's, it's a contested, you're seeing that contested space. Are they adults? Are they kids? Are they boys and girls? Are they men and women? And she comes up with the term young adults. And that is actually the origin of the term YA, interestingly enough. It's, it's a marketing term, but it comes not from people who sell books, but from people who lend books. It comes from the librarian world, which has always been, of course, of outsized importance in children's publishing compared to adult publishing. Um, it wasn't really until a few years later, in 1947, that the OED first cites the term teenager in usage from W. H. Auden, interestingly enough. Tops and tests by teenagers is a line in, the, in this poem. And th this is actually a New York poem, too. So we're, we're here sort of in the nascent space of YA as a, uh, you know, as, as a concept and of teenagers as a word. There is actually one prior thing, but it's from like popular mechanics. And so I just discount it. Um, plus it messes up my chronology because it's right before she uh, comes up with the term YA. Margaret Scoggins. So obviously by then things are, are changing really quickly and that's, that's when things take off because we're talking about the decades after the Second World War and the industrialized world is, is you know, sort of absolute beginners kind of phase of, um, of industrialization and, and consumerism and all those things and the, and the teenager gets created as a consumer, you know, sort of post-war um, idea. So we had, you know, we had thousands of years of traditions about what it meant to be a child, and thousands of years of traditions about what it meant to be an adult, and those two definitions were bound up each other with each other in a set of dependencies and responsibilities and obligations. But quite suddenly, at least in the in the time scale of sort of vast cultural shifts like this, we were all improvising and making up this thing that was to be a teenager. Now, a lot of this improvisation is, is legal in, in its nature. You know, in most countries, at some point in our teenage years, citizens reach the age where they're allowed to vote and consent to sex and drink alcohol and smoke tobacco and sign contracts and leave school and drive cars and marry and gamble and join the military and do dangerous kinds of work and just work at all or work more than however many hours a week. These laws obviously change all the time. They're buffeted by social mores and by new technologies and by moral panics which we will get back to. Moral panics about teenagers are going to be a big theme. In other words, it's, it's, it's legally speaking, it's a bit of a muddle. And the cultural aspects of being a teenager are just as tangled. Whatever teens flock to, skateboards, uh, rock and roll, file sharing, hoodies, rock music, rap music, MySpace, soon becomes the subject of a moral panic. This is because teenagers, I think, inherently frighten adults. They, they have the physical power of an adult, but they haven't been fully programmed yet. And as a such, that, you know, that makes them kind of dangerous. Um, and yet, the weird thing is that despite the sort of underlying discomfort and terror, there's also a celebration of the teen years in popular culture. They're seen as carefree and happy, a time of consequence-free exploration. In our, you know, youth worshiping commercial world, teenagers with perfect skin and symmetrical faces are, are put on a pedestal and images of teens are used to sell everything from clothes to food to music. Um, and of course, there's also a, um, the, 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 the very real human fact that those years have a certain amount of drama in them. Um, they are a time of firsts. Somewhere in all this muddle is where you uh, where most people experience your first sexy kiss, tell your first meaningful lie, suffer or commit your first real betrayal, 
Often for the first time, someone close to them dies, people drink their first beer, break their first law, have their first political awakening as teenagers. You get your first jobs and your first glimpses of independence, and your first life choices so serious that you can never completely undo them. And of course, this is a time of first love. So just to recap, we have this global culture inventing an entirely new phase of life, engaged in a messy, noisy conversation about what it means to be an adolescent. We have this sort of oppressed class whose passions are harassed and banned and whose rights are curtailed, even as their customs are celebrated and their images are ever more glorified and sexualized. And we have an age of drama and emotion and reversal where good days are transcendent and bad days feel like the end of the fucking world. And somebody said, hey, wouldn't it be cool to start writing some stories about all that shit? Like, wouldn't that be a fun thing to do? Um, and, to, and, and so a sort of what we call category YA was created. Obviously, there were books about teenagers before. Obviously, there were lots of books that teenagers read before then. But just like the invention of teenagers kind of needed a name and a specificity about it, so did the creation of category YA. Category is an adjective in, um, in, in, in publishing that might not be entirely clear. But category means, it's, it's the adjective meaning that you stick it in that section. So uh, many things might be a romance, many books might be a romance, but category romance means Mills and Boone, Harlequin, it goes in the romance section. So it's simultaneously stigmatized and also more specific. And what's interesting about YA is that we, 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 there is a sort of consensus about what the first category YA book, and it is The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton. How uh, many of you have read it, actually? Yeah, see, like, more than half the people in here have read it. It's, uh, it's about sort of warfare between class-differentiated tribes, tribes who are the, the greasers and the socials. It's about honor and sacrifice. It's a little bit of uh, Romeo and Juliet with a little bit less love and just as much stabbing. Um, I, I book scanned it yesterday and it has sold 200,000 copies this year so far. And Essie Hinton wrote it when she was, she started when she was 15, it was published when she was 18. So this is another, you know, uh, another characteristic of why is uh, quite often it is written by people very close to the age or actually at the age uh, that it represents. And the teen YA author is just a, sort of a, a figure. You run into them. If you're like me and you're going to different book festivals, you meet sort of teenage YA authors and, and they're so cute and adorable and lovable and you just hope it all works out for them. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, obviously it worked out for Essie Hinton. She could have retired at age 18. She's still making 200 grand a year, man. Um, I will give you another couple of titles from this sort of nascent space of YA. Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, and The Chocolate War. Um, a little sort of seven-year time frame. And these are sort of like a, a, a pretty much a, a triumvirate of big books at the beginning of category YA. Um, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret by Judy Bloom is about a quest for, for you know, she has a mixed marriage religion-wise. It's a quest for a single religion, but it's also about first bra, for a sanitary napkin. And of course, Roger Cormier's The Chocolate Ward is about nonconformism and mob mentality at a Catholic boys' school. Um, you know, th and these really give you a fairly good overview of, of realist themes in YA, which is basically tribalism, puberty, sexuality, nonconformity. Um, and that's, of course, stuff that we're talking about when we're, when we're inventing this phase of life called being a teenager. Now, I, full disclosure, I was a teen in this area, and I, I didn't read any of these. I, I, probably, I probably was assigned The Outsiders and thought it was pretty good. But when I went to the bookstore, I did not go to the YA section, because the YA section kind of sucked, because it was realist and it was about problem novels. I went to the other YA section, which was the science fiction section. And let me give you a sort of triumvirate of books from, from this space that I, that I read. Um, there's Starship Troopers from Robert A. Heinlein. Note the early date, 1959. It's from before Category Y existed. And what happened was Heinlein wrote these things called juveniles. And they were science fiction novels that are sort of like for 10 to 12 year olds. We would now call this middle grade, which is the, which is the, you know, the age range just below YA. And these, these juveniles, like he wrote this one called Star Soldiers. 
And it was uh, serialized, as most things were back then in a magazine called Fantasy and Science Fiction in 57, 58. And then he sent it to Scribner, his, um, his publisher for, for his juveniles, and they were like, it's kind of old. And Heinlein being Heinlein, he said, I cast thee aside forever and will never publish with you again, went somewhere else. And they published it in this ambiguous sort of like, or agnostic way, like, we don't know who it's for, we're just sending it out there. And now it's sort of generally considered a YA novel. Certainly, the protagonists are in fact teenagers. They're, um, they're, they're in basic training, most of the novel. Um, and of course, Wizard of Earthsea is high fantasy from Ursula Le Cay Le Guin. And Jean M. Owl's uh, Clan of the Cave Bear is, if you were, say, you're wanting to discuss uh, or, or discover sexuality and puberty, and you didn't want to read Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, because that was realist. If you were like a, a young skiffy girl, you would read Can Clan of the Cave Bear as a way of finding out like how the missionary position was discovered by our caveman ancestors. Um, now, the thing about it is that all these books come from the Precambrian era of YA. Uh, pardon my throat. Um, which, is, which is basically everything before this century, or everything before sort of Harry Potter. Um, and, it, and really, YA in that time was a relatively sleepy backwater of publishing. It wasn't given much space in bookstores. It wasn't given much... You know, Hollywood didn't care much about it. Very few YA novels were turned into movies. Um, but then, of course, in this century, YA has become a major part of the industry. It's the only category to have grown by double digits every year since the mid-90s. Um, although Christian publishing gets close to that, almost, almost reaches that. A YA is now a profit center that helps um, keep the rest of the industry afloat. It's the primary engine for creating new readers. The massive uh, sales of big YA mega hits keep basically are what keeps bookstores from going out of business. And in each year of this decade, um, so the last six years, more than half of the top 10 selling books of every year have been YA titles. So, so basically, if you look at the top 10 books for the last six years, five, six, seven, eight of them are YA titles. And that's, and that's top selling, not top selling novels, that's top selling books of any kind, political memoir, big celebrity books, Audubon's book for birds, like just anything with an isbin, including the Bible. I mean, the Bible has lots of isbins because there's many different translations, but so what? Um, so, so as a result, uh, YA, or, or also uh, an important thing to remember is that YA readership has grown to encompass people a lot older than teenagers. Um, you know, it doesn't make really sense to call YA novels books for teenagers. These days, uh, YA basically means books about teenagers. Um, and it's a genre, and really genres aren't for specific readers. There's no such thing as books for old people or books for, I mean, there's books for golfers, but that is books about golf. And so, so this is books about teenagers, and lots of people read them. The, the numbers on this are all over the place. Nielsen recently said uh, as much as 80% of YA readership is, uh, is adult. Um, and, and, the, and probably the biggest spike is sort of 30 to 44. It's not even the, in the 20s. Because in the, in the 20s, you, like, you go to college and you read all that stuff, and then it like, takes you a while to get back to YA. Um, so, there's a, so there's a really curious thing. And I don't think it's 80%. I think 80% of them are bought by adults, but a lot of those books get given to teenagers in their lives. But then but they're read first or read second by the adult buying them. Like the sort of one of the major means of transition or, or transmission of YA Fandom is from you know the daughter to the mother say, and you get and you get that sort of sort of lateral thing just as much as I mean um, vertical as well as lateral transmission. Um, so I'm going to now just divide this Cambrian era, the Cambrian explosion era, why into four basic categories, which are mapped onto the four category dominating titles of of this century. Um, and, and this will get us closer to what you guys came here to th think about, which was technology and stuff like that. Um, do a thing? Yes. So your basic narratives here, you got your chosen one, your paranormal romance, your dystopian, and your mortal realism. Um, now, these are mapped onto the following titles, Harry Potter, Twilight, Hunger Games, and Fault in Our Stars. Now, it is, it is hard to like, exaggerate the 
amount of influence these titles have had on the world of publishing and popular culture in general and, and fandom and even the internet in terms of what people go to the internet for and to talk about. Um, the, you know, Harry Potter I don't have to talk about except to, to note that it started off as middle grade in terms of its actual category, but as the characters aged up, the books aged up and became YA. So you can sort of like, even though Harry Potter was done in, you know, it was published in 97, it's 2000 where they sort of roughly become YA. So you have this sort of great thing where it really is the beginning of the century. Twilight in 2004 or five, uh, Hunger Games is 08, and Fault in Our Stars is 2012. Now, and these are the books that, like, like I said, if you go back across the, the, the book scan top selling books, it's just these books and their sequels and books about them, like the film thing and the this thing and the book by the Esther, the girl who kind of dies in Fault in Our Stars and all of that stuff, it's just, it just creates this huge, each of these have created a sort of in, industry around it. I mean, and that's what genres do. But you have this, you know, you, you have, I mean, these, these are really amazing publishing phenomena, but what we're, we're going to talk about mostly is dystopian um, young adult. And that's what I write for one reason. And the other reason is that's, of course, what's relevant to you guys. Um, dystopian YA. So I'm, I'm identifying with a little bit of self-interest four titles here, which are it's The Giver, which is sort of from the pre-Cambrian era, and Uglies, which I wrote, and um, The Hunger Games and Divergent. These, um, hey, where are we? So the, these, all, these series all have a lot of stuff in common. They're all dystopian in the literally, in the most literal sense of the word, which is they're set in bad places, in dystopias, bad topographies. All of them are about teenagers are in rebellion against repressive states, and all those repressive states use a combination of surveillance technologies, cultural programming, and brute force to maintain their control. Um, you know, the repression takes on various forms that are specific to each series. In, just to sort of roughly give you an idea, it's control of what we know and what we feel, control of how we see and how we look, and control of how we sort of eat and survive, and control of conformity and identity. And so all of these series are multi-million selling. In fact, in 2012, Amazon announced that Hunger Games had exceeded Harry Potter in overall sales. Um, of course, Amazon hasn't existed as long as Harry Potter, or, I mean, it has, but as a, as, as a sort of dominating category it is now. So that's part of the reason, but that's still a lot, a lot of books. It's more books than there are teenagers, which is one reason we know adults are buying YA. That's like one kind of way to prove it if you just want to cut past all of the Nielsen ratings and the ambiguous stuff. You could say, hey, look, Either they're all buying three copies or, or, uh, or there's adults buying them as well. Um, all of them have been translated into dozens of foreign markets as well. And I, and I want to pause here to uh, show you my favorite foreign color covers for uglies, um, just because they're totally awesome. Uh, this is the Japanese and the Russian cover of uglies. This is Korean and Slovakian. This is, uh, I love the Slovakian one, which is actually based on the British cover, but Slovakian sounds cooler. Um, dolls are kind of a theme here. And there's, uh, these are the complex Chinese, so, so Taiwan and Romania, and the German and the, the Portuguese, which is just horrific. Um, now, as you can see, there is, there's really a panoply of interpretations here. Um, the appeal of dystopian YA is really varied and deep and global and weird. And so what I want to talk about is why is that? Like, why do teens identify so strongly with characters and situations in literary dystopias? I'll start by saying that literary dystopias, or any kind of dystopia, is basically about extremes of social control. There's the tyranny of too much government, and there's the chaos of too little government. And there's also the ways in which those two things interact. Um, quite often, you have a dystopia that is controlling, but it comes out of some apocalyptic event in the past. That is the case with all four of those books. Um, all four, yeah, all four of those books arose in, a, or, or the, uh, the regimes in my four examples, arose in a post-apocalyptic setting after a cataclysm and chaos erased our own society. So these 
narratives aren't just about too much control, they're about an overbearing response uh, or overbearing control in response to a period of too little control. So they represent one endpoint in an oscillation between extremes of restraint, which I think is really important when you think about why teenagers like them and, and identify with them. So let me just lay this out. Let's take two examples um, from popular and literary culture and look at the characteristics of these ends of the control spectrum. So you've got too little control and too much control. So let's just make that Mad Max and Big Brother because they're um, alliterative and everybody knows those texts. Um, so the characteristics of Mad Max are dubious haircuts, unsafe driving, and warring tribes. And the characteristics of Big Brother are ubiquitous surveillance, restrictions on movement, and limited freedom of expression. So these are these sort of, if these are these sort of oscillations, if we see this as an oscillation, as, as the, two, the two things you can wind up with if, if you radically uh, reconfigure society around an issue of control and make it much more or much less. You can also put all of these things into the category of being a teenager. <laughs> Dubious haircuts, unsafe driving, worm tribes, ubiquitous surveillance, restriction on movement, limited freedom of expression. These are all what it's like to be a teenager. Um, or you could say being in high school. It's a state of being jerked back and forth along these axes, this axis, this one axis, of too much and too little control. Within school walls, students have reduced expectations of privacy. That's New Jersey versus TLO, 1980. No freedom of the press, Hazelwood versus Kuhlmanner, 1983. Their daily reality often includes clothing and hair restrictions, rising and sitting at the command of bells, and ever-increasing amount of electronic surveillance. But a few footsteps away from these sort of 1984-like subjugations, you get Mad Max. You get the warring tribes and the dangerous driving and unfortunate haircuts. And so they, they find themselves, you know, bounced back and forth between these two realities. Um, and in response, they construct their identities through necessary confrontations with authority, large and small confrontations, but also appeasements of authority and, and, and cooperation with authority. And all this leaves teens highly interested in issues of, of cultural and social control. So during my last book tour in the UK, this, this great tabloid story came out. It was a, a grandmother who was barred from a restaurant because she was wearing a black hoodie. And the management sheepishly explained when it became a big blow up that, well, it was just policy and clearly it's not aimed at grandmas, right? And everybody, and this wasn't even spoken, but everybody knew who it was really aimed at. And the thing about kids, like I said, they're, they're, they're big enough to hurt you and not old enough to be fully programmed yet. And so, so five little kids in your shop is cute. Five adults in your shop is good business. But when five teenagers gather in your shop, it's loitering. It's time to install like a high frequency sound device to drive them away or to make some rule about hoodies. It's, it's time to get rid of them. You know, as I said, whatever teens embrace, whether it's hoodies or rap or texting or file sharing or skateboards or hoverboards or fictional vampire boyfriends, it's, it's soon decried as a threat to civilization. And of course, teenagers notice this discourse going on around them. Uh, they also realize that, you know, these social panics and excesses of control don't really do that much to protect them from their problems. Censoring the school paper or the internet feed doesn't protect anyone from bullying or agonizing over their physical imperfections or from sexual predators who overwhelmingly come from their own families and not from the internet, as you guys know. Um, so in a way, they're a reflection of this new stage of life that we're all inventing together. They're at that gawky stage between being a little cute and the finished stage of being old and civilized. And that's why I read, wrote a book about them called Uglies. Although it is about, um, you know, it, the thing about Uglies is when I, when I sat down in 2003 to write it, I wasn't thinking about this stuff. I you know, wasn't really addressing these matters. I was writing a sort of nostalgic science fiction trilogy about body image and hoverboards and cool stuff I wanted to happen in my books when I was that age. But since then, I've had the privilege of you know, corresponding with 
about 10,000 teenagers who read it and who have things to say about it and who have things about the, uh, you know, things to communicate about why they liked it. And so I'm starting to get it. Uh, a quick, let's see. Just a, a quick synopsis. Ugly is, is set sort of three centuries after an oil bug has destroyed our present day economy and all but erased our species. The descendants of the survivors live in isolated city states, which are sort of ambiguous utopias where uh, citizens enjoy post-scarcity technologies, but also suffer under rigid government control. Um, the title Uglies derives from the society's coming of age tradition in which teenage uglies undergo full body plastic surgery to become pretties, simultaneously adult and beautiful. There is of course a Twilight Zone episode, not unlike this, and maybe another uh, couple of dozen science fiction novels and short stories. Well, like I said, I was going for nostalgia from my own point of view. Um, interestingly, I th the, the protagonist of the trilogy is probably most notable in that uh, her name is Tally Youngblood, and she's most notable for a shifting identity. Over the course of the books, over the trilogy, her personality is reprogrammed several times. When she becomes pretty, there is something they actually do to your brain. And then she becomes special, which is sort of the enforcer class, and she becomes sort of super strong and powerful. But again, they do something to your brain. Her memories are frequently erased, and her allegiances are pretty much always suspect. Um, and by turns, she takes on a lot of roles of vandal and outcast and runaway, prisoner, hedonist, self-mutilator, revolutionary and former enforcer, soldier, nascent politician. She, 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 she takes on all these really contradictory roles that exist both on the side of too much control and too little control. And yet the weird thing is, almost every email I get, particularly from teenage girls about this series, contains this one phrase, which is, I am Tally. They recognize themselves in, in, in all of these roles. They, they, they understand switching sides. They understand betrayal, both suffering it and and committing it, both of allies and of self, of friends and of family. And I would say that like this set of roles makes sense. It's a sensible, natural response to being bounced between the two extremes of, uh, of control. And I think you have to remember that when you talk about the way teenagers use technology, they are not only surveilled, they are also surveillers. You know, they're not only rebels, they're enforcers, they're not only jailed, they're jailers some of the time. Um, now, Tally plays all these different roles in the same way that teenagers play roles in their lives. Um, teenagers obviously trying on new hats all the time. They're saying maybe I'm a goth this week or I'm gonna do, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a reader now or I used to be uh, an Edward fan and now I'm a Jacob fan or like this there's all these kind of ways of defining yourself being divergent or you know Hufflepuff or you know there's all, all of the really successful YA trilogies have a thing where you can be a thing and where you can have your your allegiances or your house crest or whatever and and that is a, that it's a fascinating like I don't know if anyone's ever written probably somebody has uh, something about that, those, sort of, those sets of allegiances and how those allegiances operate. That's the first thing you do when you get to, um, to, to uh, Hogwarts is, is go to the Sorting Hat. It's also the first thing you do when you go to the, the Harry Potter website now is go to the Sorting Hat and you do sort of a personality quiz and it makes you a Hufflepuff or whatever, or Gryffindor. Um, and it's interesting because like some of these, some of these some of these identifications, you wouldn't think they would be super awesome. You wouldn't think anybody would be lining up to be Slytherin. But of course, lots of people are Slytherin. And I hear it all the time among you know, people in their early 20s say, saying, well, that was a real Slytherin move. And just, just as a way of identifying their, their momentary identities, Slytherin being the evil guys or, you know, sort of. Um, now, it's also, it's also what you do, this sort of like, taking on different roles is also the way that teenagers read, the ones who are um, young and widely read. Um, those of you with teenagers in their life have, have probably seen the way teenagers read. There's something super immersive or immersed about it. 
They, they, they go completely off into their own world. I'm, I'm always amused by the difference in conversation between adult writers and, and teen writers when we talk about craft. Adult writers are constantly saying, no, you can't do that because it will knock the reader out of the story. Like, you can't use any verbs other than said. Because if you, God forbid, your adult reader, you know, come across somebody yelling or screaming or barking an order. Um, we don't have that conversation in YA. And sometimes I, I sort of rib my adult writer friends and say, well, we have a different strategy for not people telling, you know, for not knocking people out of the story, and that's we tell stories. But the other thing is our readers are naturally much more immersive in their, in, in the way they, in the way they drop in. It's because they're actually, they're actually becoming those characters. They're using books as machines for becoming other people. Um, th that's probably why we talk a lot about voice in, uh, in YA circles. We talk a lot about point of view. Identification with the characters' emotions and worldview is what teens are looking for, and they're both seeing themselves in a character and the sort of opposite of that, which is becoming someone else as a character for a while. Um, they're, they're good at becoming someone else. That's one of the skill sets of being a teenager. Now, this... Okay. I would also say that the issues of surveillance and of control are a lot more immediate and domestic for teenagers. When adults are surveilled in the world, you know, say the, the NSA is following you, but the NSA does not have breakfast with you. But if your parents are spying on you, they, you wind up with them down at the, at the breakfast table. Um, or you wind up meeting your surveillors in the principal's office or in the highway, hallways of school. The, the people who are watching over kids are right there in their lives. And there's an interesting reversal in the way teens and adults engage with surveillance and control metaphorically. When we adults talk about the invasive state, we use sort of family as the metaphor. Big brother, nanny state, paternal state, cradle to grave, socialism, all these things are about family. But so, so family is the metaphor for the invasive state. But when kids are reading dystopias, they're sort of reversing that. And the invasive state is the metaphor for their family. And, you know, and for the school, and for the shopkeeper. And, and like, when you're a kid, big brother could, like, be your big brother. Your actual big brother could be narking on you and spying on you. But at the same time, your big brother could actually keep you from getting beaten up. And so, you know, all of us in this room, when we talk about security theater and, you know, and the sort of the, the uselessness of, of, of much of what governments do, teenagers live in a slightly different world where some of it is actually useful. Um, there, there are the teens who, who spend their time back around the gym where they won't be surveilled because they either want to make out or self-medicate or something like that. But there's also the teens who won't go back there because it scares them, and they have legitimate safety concerns about being in places that aren't surveilled. So there is, again, it's about being bounced back and forth between these realms of too little and too much control, and it has to do with, um, you know, not just being spied on, but safety as well. Um, so, spoiler alert, the ugly series ends when Talia and her friends overthrow this pretty regime, this plastic surgery, mind-altering regime. And the archipelago of these sort of post-apocalyptic city-states splinters into many different sort of ambiguous heterotopias. Uh, there's one in Japan where I set a companion novel to the series, Extras. Now, this is the first one where I'm actually foregrounding not the plastic surgery and mind control technology, but I'm foregrounding more information technologies. And in extras, um, in, in extras, basically, it's a literal reputation economy. Everyone in the city has a face rank, which is the number, like, how many, what, what, you know, you know that you are the 148,368th most famous person in the city. And people quoting you or dressing like you or going to your feed or repeating something that you said or repeating a catchphrase that you created cre increases your face rank and people forgetting about you and not doing it decreases your face rank as other people take over. Um, this is actually came out in 2007. I s 
actually started writing it before Twitter was actually a thing. I mean, it was a thing at sort of South by Southwest. I didn't know about it. But, but I, was looking, I was actually looking not so much at Twitter and things like that as just authors checking their Amazon numbers. And, but, the, but the whole idea that you could put numbers on things is obviously, uh, you know, was, was ripe for a certain kind of parody and a certain kind, of, and, and kids obviously recognize this stuff too. Um, and my, my next project is, well, my, my next book in the Ugly series is going to further foreground the, um, you know, surveillance technologies and go, and go almost completely into the world of ubiquitous surveillance, which is what I'm going to talk about in our breakout session afterwards. I don't want to talk about it too much now because this is going to go on the internet and this book won't be out for several years and it might not be a great idea. Um, <laughs> so, because I don't want, like, you know, people stealing my idea. So, um, so, so, so just to wrap up, though, it, it's interesting, like, I haven't foregrounded ubiquitous surveillance in any of the ugliest books. And obviously, some kids react to it and say, ugh, I would hate to live in that world of no privacy. Whenever I talk to young people, I used to use this example of, of dealing with new technologies, which was talking about kids in South America who are at risk of kidnapping, getting chipped with locator chips. And I had to stop using that um, I had to stop using that example because it replaced all other conversations. That is all the kids would ask about after that. They wouldn't ask about the books. They wouldn't do anything except talk about being chipped because they were just, because they, and I was like, how many of you do you think your parents would do that if that was like easy to do? And they, every hand went up. And how many of you, do, would you want that? Three hands go up. How many of you would do that to your kids? Again, like half, 60% of the hands go up. So it's like, the, the, you know, a classic kind of generational thing. I, I would do it to my kids, but I wouldn't want my parents to do it to me. Um, so, so they're really interested in that stuff, but it wasn't foregrounded. And so I, I'm inclined to actually do something with my next book that, that, that opens up that space so kids can really have a place to talk about, or science fiction place to talk about ubiquitous surveillance and the kinds of uh, responsibilities and permissions and, and, and spaces you could carve out for yourself of privacy and all that stuff, how, how all that would work with, uh, you know, in a future society. What, what's the sort of EULA structure of that? Um, you know, like Tally's world, ours is sort of primarily concerned with surfaces and we, we use plastic surgeries for real diseases. And the thing about teenagers is they're newcomers to this world, so they're actually really good at seeing through the chicanery of it. And, but at the same time, they have fewer power, less power and fewer resources to escape the, uh, to escape the power of, that, of those kinds of traditions. Um, so they really wind up in the worst of both worlds. They have too much government and they have too little. And I think that is why literary dystopias are something that has become kind of a, a mega genre in YA, and it's something that people read. Like, I, I know all these agents and editors who are like, I don't want to read another dystopian ever, ever, ever in my life. We're not publishing any more of those. But the market is still there, and people still want to read it. And it's, you know, it's obviously a, uh, it's, it's something that teenagers understand on a lot of different levels in a lot of different ways, not just as rebels, but as enforcers. And you know, not just as a as um, as oppressed people, but as oppressors. Um, so that's kind of it. <laughs> Who's got questions? So the, please, I'm going to start with this. Is that? There's a bunch of people in this room who are trying to understand different aspects of inequality around privacy and surveillance. And the differences in which we see it between um, those who are extraordinarily privileged, for whom their primary and first actors are going to be their family, and those who are less privileged because they're dealing with social services, they're under foster care, right. they're dealing with the state in terms of local cops in their everyday you know, business, stop and frisk issues, et cetera. How much are you able or seeing some of these inequity questions come into the storylines, not just that you write, but the ways in which you get feedback to a lot of the materials that you write? Right, well, there's, there's two things. One thing which I, th I thought was in there, but somehow I missed it, which is there, who gets to be a teenager is obviously tremendously 
it's, it's politicized, it's, it's about economics, it's about um, culture. Obviously, there's lots of people in the third world who don't get to be teenagers, and if you're a 14-year-old black male in America, there's many situations in which you don't get to be a teenager, you know, whether in the criminal justice system or down the barrel of a gun or in the, the newspaper the next day when you're just not, not really an angel or something like that as opposed to being a 14-year-old. Um, so that's, that's obviously a huge part of, of, uh, of, of the political dynamic of the invention of teenagers is, we, is it's not an all-inclusive term. It's not something that everybody gets to do and that everybody has been invited into. Other people, you know, one of the, it's, it's a sign of privilege that you, you're, you can be a teenager for longer if your parents can support you until you're 30 or if that's just what's done in your social circles. Basically, you can be a teenager from when you're sort of from some point you're sort of 10 and you get your first iPhone earlier than everybody else until you're like 35 and your trust fund comes to you and you can actually control your own money for the first time. So it is, it is, a, it is you know, the length of your teenager in us is a signifier of privilege. And so for some people that is extremely, exceedingly small. Um, as far as the way YA operates, um, you know, I, I think the main class difference is that you come to literature through um, through your your parents as a as as a privileged child and and it's more like through some sort of other gatekeeper like a librarian um, if you're if you're less privileged a lot of libraries right now are basically social centers a lot of librarians especially YA librarians are largely are sort of social workers um, they're providing in fact, that's that big brothery surveilled space that kids need. They're providing a safe place to go after school, especially for latchkey kids or whatever. So you're, you're winding up going into this, um, into this place of books, and that's where you get that sort of measure of safety for a while. And I think that is an important reason why um, both dystopian novels speak to them, but it's also just a, a reason why so many kids read YA. Um, yeah. But do you think that you end up with an inequity line across that? Like this, it's one of those, you know, even as you think about who becomes your readers, how do you navigate that as part of your storyline? Or how do you see some of your, I mean, for example, we see it a lot in Hunger Games, right? There's definitely class conversations there right. and ways that play out. But I'm trying to think through how that's operationalized, especially as we start to think about technology into those conversations. Yeah, I mean, Uglies is a, is a post-scarcity society. So, so they, they look at, um, you know, so, so poverty is just this thing that used to happen and ha that has a, uh, and, and it was like, and like stu people were stupid for doing it, just like people were stupid for getting diseases or, or for, um, you know, or for discrimination in the past. And so, 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 the, so it's not as immediate as critique as Hunger Games, obviously. Um... But do, but do you mean as an author or as a, as a, as a craftsman, as a... I mean, just like, as you're trying to reach to different audiences, it becomes a, yeah. a challenge of talking across those lines. Well, there's a, there's a tiered thing that happens when you... When I, I've just been on tour for my latest book, series, and the... Um, and every day you, like, fly at 6 a.m., and then you go to a couple schools. And quite often, one of those schools, you know, they'll be on the different sides of town. So one of the schools will be more, um, more hard scrabble or Title I or whatever. And you, you won't sell any books, but it's like you're doing a good thing or whatever. And your, your publicist sort of sets all this stuff up. And then you go to like a, a richer school, and they will all have cards. And will just be able to like go, Whoop, I would like a copy of the book you just talked about. And you'll sell a lot of books. And then you go to a bookstore at night. And, and interestingly, you're getting a, a, you know, a, a mix of, of kinds of, of class there because you have the, the people who grew up in bookstores because their parents are nice liberals. And you, and you wind up with the people who, who, again, are using the bookstore, sometimes it's a library event, as a sort of, as a sort of safe space where they know they won't get hassled and they can spend time and they can talk to other people who, who like books like they do and they don't have enough other people in their lives who, who have those kind of like literary values. Question. 
Hi. Um, hey. Thank you so much for the presentation. It was really fantastic. Um, so I have, it's not a really well-formed question, but um, so you describe really well the ways in which teenagers or young adults uh, kind of project different identities onto the different facets of the dystopian novels, right? The law enforcer and the kind of rebel uh, side of things. But what about adults? Like, don't you think that adults do the same thing when they read? I mean, and what kind of distinction would you draw between young adults and adults in how they relate to literature and especially sci-fi, shall we say? Yeah, I mean, I will say that coming out of, I, I wrote adult science fiction novels before I wrote YA. And there's a lot of characteristics that are similar. I feel like a lot of times people will ask me, uh, so what's the difference between writing YA, you know, uh, adult books and, and books for teens? And they always frame it negatively. Like, what can't you do in a teen novel? They want to know, like, can you use the word fuck? Or, you know, can you have this or that or whatever? And I'm like, well, that's not really the difference. The difference is um, t teenagers have different sort of reading protocols. They're, they because they are more immersed, because they're, they're also, like, I do this sometimes. I was at this great school recently, or a bookstore event, and there was a bunch of adults over here. For whatever reason, all the teenagers were over here. And I was like, oh, let's just do a little experiment. How many of you are learning for a foreign language? It was like, boom, whoomph. How many of you can have memorized the songs, you know, the lyrics of 30 songs? Two hands here, whoomph, all the hands go up here. How many of you call your friends by nicknames? How many of you are, you know, generated a new piece of slang in the last month? And every question having to do with linguistic generation, like the, 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 the creation of meaning and language and, and acquiring of language, the teenagers, all their hands went up and the adults, none of their hands went up or two or three of them. And so when you're, when you're writing for teenagers, you're writing for an audience that is acquiring lots of new words. And it's something like, in a, in a series like Uglies, I, you know, I coin a lot of new words coin a lot of new spaces. And one of the things I discover is that people transmit, the, the sort of lateral transmission of uglies is because people were talking the language of the book and someone said, what are you guys talking about? And they said, in order to learn this language that we are speaking, you must read this book. Um, and I don't think that happens. I mean, it happens among a certain sort of nerdy adult, but you have a broader uh, range of, of, of nerdier, more immersive, more language generating readers at, at certain age levels, just because the, the mechanics of language acquisition and generation favor the young and, and brain plasticity and things like that. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. I, I just had a question about, you, you distinguish the chosen one from the dystopian, um, but often they do overlap. And I've always been sort of curious about what it is to do with the messianic figure that pervades these novels, because it, it was so useful the way you distinguish between sort of too much uh, structure and too little, but it seems like the tragedy of the messianic figure is the inability to imagine an emergent structure, either technological or social. Um, and so I'm just curious, as an author thinking about writing this, what, what are your thoughts around that? Well, I don't, I mean, I really don't think that, like Katniss, the protagonist of the uh, Hunger Games, and, and, and Tally Youngblood, my character, neither of them are, they, they may wind up messianic, but they, don't, but they don't start that way. They sort of wind up. It's just a bunch of stuff that happens to them. Like it, Katniss isn't trying to overthrow the government. She's trying to save her sister. Tally isn't actually trying to overthrow the government at all. She actually starts off as an informer on her friend because she just wants the operation to be pretty. And she's coerced into her role. Um... And, and it's not just that they're reluctant saviors, they're actually people who, who sort of just sort of wind up. And I think maybe that's a difference between, an overall difference between technology and magic is uh, technology, if we can actually separate those two things. Technology tends to be a bit more sort of democratic, everyone can use it, you don't have to be the seventh daughter of the seventh daughter you know, to, to flick a light switch. You don't have to believe the light switch is going to turn on the light. You can be a mop falling against the light switch and it still works. Uh, nature, nature doesn't, small n nature doesn't care who you are, the stuff just works. Whereas big n nature wants things to be a certain way and big m magic wants you to be pure of heart if you're gonna do X, Y, or Z. So I think that is a big difference between say Harry Potter having a hero who overthrows an evil regime and Hunger Games having a 
you know, she is just the person who winds up in, in, in a bad situation and she's got to deal with it. Um, but I think that's, you know, that's a, this is a, a nerdy conversation about the difference between technology and magic and right. fantasy and science fiction. And I got, a, I got a whole slide about it I could show you from a different talk, but, uh, but I won't. <laughs> Um, hi. hi. One of the things that interests me about the teenage genre is um, the acceptance of paradox and how, uh, how do you think teenagers connect to that versus adults? And I think that has a lot to do with data because in our data we do find a lot of paradox and through that creativity and other interesting things. But do you find teenagers connect with that more or adults? or? So what do you mean by paradox? Are you using this term mathematically? Or well, if you say that, the, that people's identities exist for moments and teenagers can connect to that, right. um, understanding that the flux and the, the paradox that exists in that flux and that, and that both exist at the same time, and does that make sense? Yeah. No, I do know what you mean. I mean, I think that it's interesting. There's, you know, there's a lot of those four... Many of the titles I mentioned here today have romantic triangles in them, where there's a, a girl choosing between two boys, say. Um, th there is a, a sliver of that in uglies. It certainly happens. But the major relationship that defines the books is the relationship between Tally and her best friend, Shay. Because they start off as, they have the same birthday, which means they're going to have the operation at the same time. So they start off bonding over that because neither will leave the other by graduating to prettiness first. But they, wind, they keep winding up being on opposite sides. Like when, when Shay goes off to be a rebel, Tally is a bit of an informer. When Shay gets the pretty operation, Tally's the rebel. So they, they basically keep, although they're friends, they keep winding up hating each other. And I think and, and I get a lot of email which is like, oh, that's like me and my best friend. Like we are best friends one day and then we hate each other the next day. And I think that the, that fluidity of, um, it, it's, you know, fluidity of loyalty and, and sudden shifts of emotion, what we would probably call hormones, is a kind of, is a kind of experiential violence that takes place when you're uh, a teenager. And like the things that are important to you shift really quickly and like, 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 you know, those of you who had to, have ever had to buy stuff for a teenage relative, it's like you, you get them the album that they wanted so much a month ago and their mother wouldn't let them have, and then they're like, oh, that. Like, that is so last Tuesday. And, and that sort of suddenness and fluidity is, is a, you know, it's, a, it's a, a terrible, terrible, awful cliche about teenagers, but it has some truth in terms of, in terms of this kind of role play. And, and I think, so that comes off as paradox, paradox, but what it really is is just, Shifting identities. And paradoxes, I think, are more simultaneous. Anyway. Um, I'm just curious if you could make a um, subjective, thoroughly unscientific... Um, <laughs> I think I'm pretty good at that, <laughs> I, as you can see. Um, sort of remark about the newness of what's happening with teenagers. So I, I don't get to work a lot with teenagers at all, but I work a lot with technology and know that, you know, lots of moral scares happen around new old technologies when they were new. And, right. you know, if you are a student of history, you know things repeat. And so I feel like there's always media discussions around, well, teenagers now are so different. And I'm I'm just curious if you have sort of thoughts about, like, what is new about the current generation or what is the same or I know it's sort of an annoying question but I'm just really curious <laughs> yeah I mean that is a that's it's a it's a question we're we're, we're actually my co-authors and I of my latest book that just came out that I was just on tour for called zeros we we're trying to do something with it um, and in a, in a purely sort of metaphorical way and and what we what we decided to do that would be interesting was we, we gave all our, our characters superpowers that are crowd-based. Um, for example, there's one guy whose like, code name is Anonymous, and, he, um, and if you're in an elevator with him alone, you, you can see him and talk to him perfectly well, but someone else gets on the elevator, your interest in him will start to shift and drift, 
if like 10 people get on the elevator after that, you kind of are completely not aware he's there. In fact, you forget that you ever talked to him at the beginning. So he has crowd-based invisibility. There's another character called Flicker. She's with an E. She's, um, she's blind, but she can see through other people's eyes, sort of in, a, in a, a periphery around her. So in a room alone, she's blind. In a room with several other people, she has eyes to choose from. In a huge crowd, she becomes omniscient. So all of these, all of these characters have superpowers that are dependent on other people being around to events themselves. And so they are, you know, to put it bluntly, they're crowd-based, crowd-sourced superpowers. Um, and I would say that is, a, you know, that is a, a genuine new technology and new way of being a teenager is, 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 is doing your homework in a group on Twitter, um, watching the Oscars to make it tolerable with like 100 other people making jokes about it, overthrowing the government of Egypt, like whatever it is you want to do, you do it with lots of other people and that's sort of made, um, I mean, and, and it's, a, it's an argument I've made about why, why this Cambrian explosion of why it has happened is, is, the short answer is the internet, because the internet is very good at making reading social. Um, it used to be that you only had those five other people who'd read the book at your, at your cafeteria table to like talk pretty talk with, in, in the case of my fans, or to argue about whether you're Hufflepuff or Gryffindor, or to, um, or to do fan art for. Like if you did fan art, you could just show it to like four other people. But now if you draw Katniss and it's really cool and awesome, or you do your pumpkin whatever carving, you, 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 100,000 people could see it. And I think that, you know, when you make something social, teenagers become exponentially more interested in it. And I think, um, and I think the internet making reading social is part of this, part of this shift, both in YA, in, in, in terms of its great numbers, and just as, as a shift of what a, being a teenager is. And being a human being, it's not distinct to teenagers, but they are the sort of the ones getting it, the ones who are native to it. Yeah. So, so when I get together with friends, I have one friend, if, if it's a biography of a dead president, he's read it, wants to talk about it. Have another friend who reads every young adult novel series known to mankind. I mean, he just likes it. He likes the science fiction genre, and he's not a young adult, not in his 20s, not even in his 30s. What do you make of the adults kind of sneaking into the young adult section, you know, buying these books, watching these movies, kind of participating in that genre? I mean, I, I, I would imagine a lot of folks in here have read at least one of the Hunger Games, maybe all of the Harry Potters. What, what do you make of adults kind of leaning into this genre? That, that's something that we are currently discussing a lot as a genre. I mean, obviously it's cool to have more readers. It's, it's nice for, and, and, and one of the reasons why that happens is simply what I was talking about before, the sort of teenagers are interesting to write about. They're in a new stage of life that's being newly formed. They, they're having lots of cool first things happening to them. There is lots of drama that you can metaphoricalize, like the world is going to end, because it feels like the world's going to end when you're 15, quite often. Or, you know, or just, just the, you know, the first kiss. All that stuff is great drama. It's great, and it's fun to read. Like the, the first time you, if someone says, I love you to you is different than the 10,000th time someone says I love you to you by a lot and in a way that's useful as a novelist and as a reader. Um, so I think that's just a reason why adults read YA is because it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, so the question is, what do we, you know, how do we feel about it? It's obviously nice to have more sales and more fans. And it's nice that the people who read Uglies when they were 13, who are now 23, are still, you know, in my genre. That's cool too. Um, but, but there, there are actually a lot of issues now with just keeping YA or, or creating some kind of teen space for YA. There are, I went to a, a, the Texas Teen Book Festival, or the Houston, Houston Teen Book Festival, and, um, oh man, which one was it? Oh, the Dallas Teen Book Festival, sorry. <laughs> it was last year, it was earlier this year. Oh God, I'm in trouble now. Um, but they, they quite specifically make it easier, like a lot of these teen festivals, like there's very few teens there because the 20 year olds have money and cars and like they drive from th for hundreds of miles in a way that teenagers can't to get to them. And so the way this <laughs> nameless teen festival in Texas works is that they reserve the front rows for, uh, 
for teenagers. They create sort of systems to bus and move teenagers in so they don't have to get rides from their parents. And at the same time, they, uh, and they, then they make it so that like, you don't answer questions from adults until all the teenagers have, have no, until there are no teenage hands raised. And the adults ask, you know, stuff like, how do you get an agent? Like, you know, fuck you. But, <laughs> but I mean, when a 12-year-old asks that, it's awesome. <laughs> but when a, you know, when a 30-year-old asks that, it's like, yeah, that's, that's why you showed up. It's not to listen to me, but to ask that question. And it's, so it's like, I'm, so, so there is a, there, there, that's, a, that's a thing we're all talking about. We're in, the, we're in the throes of that and talking about what it means to be writing for teenagers and, to, and for some spaces to not include teenagers in the way they should and for teenagers to get even feeling a little bit pushed out. I mean, there's always been adults, adults messing with YA as gatekeepers in many other ways, but this, as fans, is a new thing. Yes. One last question. Okay. I have two questions. Ah, <laughs> yay! <laughs> no, I'll just ask one. The first one was kind of related to what he said. Um, I'm interested in this point you made earlier about teenagers identifying with Tally because of her shifting identities. Um, because this point seems to come in the context of all of these books that you mentioned have really set groups or communities. Like with Harry Potter, there's a big difference between being Slytherin and being Hufflepuff. Or like in Divergent, it's the same thing. Even in The Giver or The Outsiders, all of those seem to have very yep. set social groups. And it seems that people get a lot of pride from them. And then you talked about people identifying with Tally, and yet all the identities that you talked about her having seem to be things that she's forced into or that are like pushed upon her and are very repressive. And so I'm wondering if you can tease out some of the tensions within that. Ah, that, that is interesting. I mean, she is, um, the, there's, there's an essay about this very thing having to do with her and Shay, the other character. Uh, her best friend character actually, when they meet, her best friend is like, oh, I want to go off to this place called The Smoke where we get to keep our own face. And Tally's like, mm, forget that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to eat bugs and be ugly the rest of my life. So, so she is actually... Um, so Shay would normally be the main character in this book. Like, like Shay, you could rewrite the Ugly series and Shay would be the, the main character because she does everything first and Tally kind of follows along and blunders along. Um, and I don't, you know, I, I, Tally is certainly a fairly active character. People don't complain about her being passive because she also is super headstrong and is reacting very much to, to, to the pressures put on her in a, in a sort of, in a, in a way that's sort of kick-ass, as we say, in terms of female characters. She's a strong female protagonist. But, um, but, but I do feel like coercion is such a big part of what we're talking about in, um, in a dystopian novel. Coercion is a big part of being a teenager. Um, it's a big part of being a kid, is you get, you, your parents bargain with you, and they give you this if you do that, and you can wear those shoes, but only if you do your homework, and you can, I'll buy you this if you do that. There's that sort of like, um, the, the, the way authority works a lot of it has to do with the fact that, you know, teenagers, again, we can't just command them, we can't just pick them up and move them like we can little kids, like you're coming with me to the museum now. Like, and you just strap them in the stroller, strap them in the car seat and they have to go somewhere. You have to negotiate more with teenagers. So that, that sense of low level uh, coercion and persuasion being a part of, I mean, they don't, the government doesn't force her to, to, to become an informer. They say, if you don't be an informer, then we will never give you the operation and you'll be ugly for the rest of your life with your just regular, natural born, ugly face. And that's how they coerce her to betray her best friend. So, um, so that, that's kind of what I was, you know, rather than having a, you know, a, a fully, a fully sort of questioning everything character from the beginning, I thought it would, it just seemed more representative to me, representative of teenage years to, to have a character reacting to coercion. So it's always fun to sort of see how all of these books get made, to see all of how the technology conversations uh, that we have end up getting baked in and, and spreading around culture. And so thank you so much, Scott, for doing thank this. You. This is fabulous. Thanks, a great question. Thank you. Thank you.